where the mother either did not know or was unable to cope with her pregnancy or plan for the birth. If she was aware of the pregnancy, she likely never sought care and hid it from everyone she knew. Sadly, the infants born under these conditions are those most at risk of being abandoned, harmed, or killed in the moments and days after birth. This law is intended to protect these babies by providing the mothers with a safe and anonymous alternative. Back in 2000, when this first became law in Minnesota, it was to great fanfare. The media devoted a significant amount of time to the issue, and helped, which helped to raise awareness of the new law. Additionally, a nonprofit organization was created with the goal of raising funds to continue to educate Minnesotans about the law. This organization created a website and had a toll-free phone number. But 15 years later, the law is old news, and the nonprofit organization is disbanded. And most significantly, a new generation of women who may be in need are mostly unaware of the existence of Minnesota's safe place for newborns law. And that is where this legislation fits in. House File 825 seeks an appropriation for the Department of Human Services to increase awareness of the law. DHS has worked with the counties in the past in efforts to raise awareness. They also have information on their website and have created a poster of which a copy is in your packets. While it is the author's intention to allow DHS flexibility in determining how to best raise awareness for the safe place for newborns law, some thoughts that we have had for cost-effective methods include distributing the existing poster to high schools and post-secondary institutions across the state and encouraging them to hang them in girls' bathrooms, distributing the posters to cities and counties and asking them to hang them in appropriate locations, create keyword-based targeted social media ads, place posters in key locations, perhaps mass transit shelters, and uh, provide them to youth organizations, and work with counties and other entities to encourage them to also raise awareness of the law. I thank you for the opportunity to explain this legislation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shaw, for your testimony, and uh, are there any questions? Representative Hoffman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Representative Peterson. I'm wondering why you've um, located this within the Department of Human Services when it's typically our Department of Health that does community outreach on health topics, has built the networks um, with health care providers, does most of our health education, health promotion work with the schools and with others. Representative Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Boffler. Actually, we did have this conversation uh, because it is a good question, but I am going to refer to Ms. Wildberg to explain the rationale behind that. Ms. Rob. Uh, Representative Boffler and, and members of the committee. Um, there were several reasons why we decided to have the Department of Human Services uh, take this on. First of all, they have actually already done uh, quite a bit of work on this issue as far as raising awareness and working with the counties, providing information on their website, creating the poster. Um, and we have been in communications with them actually for several years, encouraging them to continue to raise awareness of the law. They have indicated that they are very supportive of taking on that role, but they did not have the resources to do so. Uh, we also thought that because this is a program that really affects a, a fairly targeted segment of the population for the most part, that there could probably be some very cost-effective strategies to get that information out rather than doing the kind of outreach that the Department of Health usually does with a, a more broad-based campaign with billboards on the, you know, on the highway and, and those kinds of efforts. Well, Mr. Chair, I would just say I think that that probably is a mischaracterization of our health department. I think they've done some really good work targeting particular audiences with, that are more at risk for certain health conditions, um, socioeconomic difference, racial cultural differences, and I, um, I actually think they do have some expertise in this area. Representative Schultz, Mr. Chair, I move House Bill 825 
committee, which is where the forums are. We have met and called a meeting a lot longer than before. Not online. Uh, I do have a question. And, and uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Pearson, what was your thought on dollar amount for where you were at in your appropriation since it's empty at this point? Representative Pearson. Mr. Chair, Representative Sean, uh, thank you for that question. We were thinking that an uh, appropriate amount at this time would be $250,000, and it would be a one-time appropriation that would be available until it was fully expended. And uh, one of the reasons why I think we were looking at the organization that we have it in here is because they're closest to the people that might be dealing with these issues. And although the Department of Health is excellent at providing wonderful information, etc., we thought that um, the other department would have a better opportunity to do the targeted uh, information, so it was the most effective way to communicate with the targeted population we're trying to reach. Thank you, Representative Pearson. Uh, before we go to Representative Evil, we should call the meeting to order officially. And uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes for February 25th, 2015? Representative Peterson moves approval of minutes for February 25th. Are there any additions or corrections? Seeing no additions or corrections, all those in favor of approval say aye. Those opposed, no. Motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Uh, Representative Liebel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Pearson, I just was intrigued by what you just said. Could you be a little more clear? You said something like that department was closer to the people who would be affected by this issue. Could you please tell us who you're talking about? Representative Pearson. Mr. Chair, Representative Lee, the Commissioner of Human Services is working directly with the counties that might be or potentially any other issues, and that's why we thought that they might be best suited to determine who is the targeted population that we want to make sure that we're reaching out to. Um, I guess it could be our English department is the better suited one. We would just like to make sure that the information gets out to the populations, which typically tend to be teens, and, and distribute the posters to um, high schools and provide the social media, I guess, from the standpoint of which commissioner is best. Um, we certainly can change that if that's important to this committee. It's, for us, it's about really getting the information out to um, the people that are most affected by this. Representative Liebel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Peterson, the um, Department of Health works really closely with the local health departments. So, um, you know, certainly working with the counties will certainly not give you DHS over MDH. And I have to agree with Representative Lothar on this. I think that in terms of getting health information out, um, certainly I would think of MDH, Minnesota Department of Health, as the place that's used to that. And especially, for example, if teenagers are in your audience, and, you know, that sounds reasonable to me, I would certainly think that MDH would be in a better position to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Liebling, we are certainly open to whichever commissioner this committee thinks is best. Other comments? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Russell. Representative Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, looking through the information that and I don't see it. I'm going to ask it if I missed it. I apologize. What's the incidence that we're talking about here annually? How many, how many of these cases do we have? Ms. Rao. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Marcel, and members of the committee, um, we don't know exactly. Um, in the most recent years, uh, according to the Department of Human Services, in 2013, there were three relinquishments. Through this program in 2012, uh, they reported that there were two of them. Prior to that, there was no official record keeping from what we understand, but they estimate that between 2000 and 2011, there were 18. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Other questions? Representative Schultz. Uh, this is the real period of time. All right, that's next up. Uh, seeing no other questions, will the Justice 
Um, to our representative, um, actually, we, we need to move the bill. Actually, first, I would like to move uh, House File 825 for the board of the committee. And uh, Representative Schoen, we would like to move the 8 1 amendment to this bill. Uh, Representative Schoen, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, the, uh, the bill or the amendment also, I'd like to just uh, uh, make this as okay with the chair. Uh, replace uh, on 1.6 planned parenthood with the seeming family planning grants for clinics that receive family planning grants. Uh, Ms. Ames could uh, incorporate that. We'll see if that, uh, how that works. Mr. Chair, the amendment will be on page one, line six. Delete planned parenthood after clinics insert receiving family planning grants. So the sentence would read, um, and the sentence would read, and to clinics receiving family planning grants. When I first uh, saw the uh, bill come through, I, I uh, didn't have appropriations, so I thought I'd try to help out a little bit. Um, one of the things that I know, especially in greater Minnesota, is just, okay, where, where do we go? Uh, in Minnesota, we have eight regional EMS uh, programs that are largely funded through seatbelt dollars uh, that uh, handle training, uh, outreach, other things for your local uh, areas, such as they might appropriate uh, money for uh, uh, Leaders or other equipment purchases that your local EMS providers uh, need. Uh, what I'd like to do with this is I thought this was a, a great way for them to help out those regional programs. If we appropriated money through the commissioner, that would be uh, divided amongst them and uh, the other folks that uh, that we have that receive funds from positive abortion alternative grants and, and family planning grants, that uh, we would actually establish a dollar amount and then work from there to say, well, you know what? If you call, we want you to know whether you need to sign at the fire station. If you need to do local community outreach in the paper, they, they, they can reach you. They can do that uh, locally and uh, be able to work through that because I figure each community kind of knows what they might need, whether it's social media. I think you're right. That's a good start. Uh, but local papers, local radio stations, and depending upon where you are in the state, that may be the case. And uh, to this day, I believe that Ambulance Association haven't had anybody call for an ambulance to pick up uh, a newborn, uh, but that probably wouldn't be the worst thing that happened. So this also appropriates funding that the ambulance service will be able to submit and get paid for that service where we have the state and basic uh, life support unit, like up in uh, Representative Backers District, we owe a $900 uh, ride with, uh, uh, with equipment and, and billing anywhere from $650 to $900. In that range, so uh, we would like to take that. I want to take that fear away, and anything else that uh, the person may have, and it's still within the guidelines of the law. We can use the information for prosecution or follow up. It's just about taking care of that baby. So I hope you find this is a friendly moment to get it started in the right direction of getting us guided on what we should actually do uh, with this bill, and it actually appropriates money. Representative Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Sean. Um, we do consider this a friendly amendment, and again, we are open to uh, anything that this committee would agree to to help further the cause. Um, you know, we're not demanding it either, so we're pretty neutral on it. Would you like to add anything else, Ms. Ralph? Ms. Ralph. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I. This amendment is fine. I guess our opinion is, or my opinion is, it would be up to the committee whether or not they wish to accept it. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rowe. Other questions from the committee members? I just uh, I have one uh, for Representative Sean regarding your amendment A1. Um, line 1.6 uh, as you amended it. Um, Commissioner shall distribute information to programs that receive positive 
support an alternative grants and funding for receiving family planning grants. Have you looked at the statutory and budget implications of what that would actually mean? And I'm a little reticent to send things on the fly um, with uh, the impact of that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, have, what have you looked at in terms of the statutory implications of that? Who would get that? Who wouldn't get that? How would that work? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, I've been kind of it goes to me like my fiscal note. That was what that is the same as Representative Peterson's on her bill that she brought before the committee. I think that that's a discussion on uh, uh, where, you know, if it's, if it's a half a million dollar appropriation, then um, this is probably something we can look at to see how does that affect uh, the agency as well, too. And I don't know uh, exactly. So it's, it's whatever is in that grant appropriation. Uh, would be uh, in those two areas instead of making it well named. That was the, the mistake. Is it like and clear that it was the same as said, whoever it may be in whatever community, whoever uh, uh, Representative Hagen has out in Glencoe, uh, if they qualify for it, they should have uh, have some uh, ability to uh, be part of this as well, too. Sure. Uh -huh. And uh, Representative Sean, you referenced a fiscal note brought forward by. Uh, Representative Peterson. Mr. Chair, the point being is that Representative Peterson still didn't have any money attached to it. And we're in the finance committee. I'm just trying to come up with a dollar figure and, and do the right figure and see if it's uh, started in the right direction. And I know that our local ambulance services and fire departments and first responders can do a lot of help for us to move this bill out that means. And uh, anything that we can do that to help that along, I think that's a good start. I mean, the other parts of this is it's a great discussion. Representative McDonald. Hey, Mr. Chair. Question for uh, this is related to the amendment for the author, uh, Representative Peterson. Um, the uh, info that we have from health research is other states have done this. Um, 19 other states have done it. The infants up to a one month old, 12 states have done it with the uh, infants are 72 hours or younger. How have they best financed? Uh, and helped with some monies to help these states with the EMS and the hospitals and all the parties interested. Thank you, Representative Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Representative McDonald. Um, I'm not sure if I have the full amount of information, however, I will refer to Ms. Rowell if she does it. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative McDonald, members of the committee. Um, I, I don't know the answer for all of the states. I did look into it a little bit actually this morning to kind of see exactly what I found here in Minnesota and in, in similar states. When I looked up Safe Place for Newborns here, it actually directed me to a website in Wisconsin that I believe is run by a nonprofit group similar to probably what we previously had here in Minnesota that had been set up to, to raise awareness of the law. There is a national organization that also tries to help states out, uh, but when I looked at, at the information that was available on their website specific to Minnesota, um, it was outdated. It was prior to the changes that we made to the law a few years ago, um, and so they're not doing a, a great job, unfortunately, of keeping that information fresh um, and, and current. And so we think it's appropriate for, our, for the state to step in at this point um, and, and help out make sure people have uh, awareness of the law and the specifics of it here in Minnesota. Mr. Chair, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, on the surface, I think Representative Sean's amendment uh, seems to be uh, he's a good placeholder. We're talking about the lives of babies who are uh, dropped off or picked up by an ambulance or whatever. The babies may be dropped off in this place. In this case, with a safe place. So, uh, it might be an um, resident to say maybe $500,000 isn't enough. How much is enough to save a baby? Million? Two? Three? I don't think any of us could even put on that. How about priceless? So, uh, I understand uh, we have to be cautious of what the wording says, because every word means something in law. Uh, but I think uh, placeholder. Uh, it's a good idea for amount. Um, 
and it would be equal to know if other states maybe a million dollars is uh, the adequate amount. Maybe five hundred thousand would be we don't know, but I think a number would be appropriate to put in there. But at least it's a placeholder. And actually I would offer a, a written or an oral on the same uh, process. <laughs> A lot of money is, uh, you know, it's not enough amount of money to save it, okay? So I, I'm emotional with Felix Thank you, Representative McDonald. Representative Shaw. Mr. Chair, I want to uh, offer some comfort to you and the committee and just and point out that we have our staff is as smart as they come. And uh, so what this does is tell, in that appropriation, it tells the commissioner that they have to distribute this to those folks that uh, get those grants. So it's not the grantees or the, the folks receiving the grants that are incurring the cost. It's from the department the, in the appropriation. And then those uh, agencies that receive the grants are obligated to disseminate that information that's provided from the state. Uh, thank you, Representative Shaw. That doesn't provide uh, a whole lot of clarity for me. And it, it occurs to me that we do have uh, quite a bit of um, resources that currently flow to these uh, clinics that you're referencing uh, for the promotion of uh, what they do and have a great deal of budget for that. And I'm very concerned that this might, in fact, be a way to send this in the wrong direction. For that reason, I would speak against the A1 amendment as for roll call on it. Further discussion? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Shaw, on the uh, receiving family grants, uh, any tax and receiving family grants, grants what, what are the facilities that receive the family grants? The, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Donald, uh, receiving family planning grants. So it could be whoever fits under that, uh, whoever currently gets them now, that's who it is. It's not just one, it's not just Planned Parenthood, it's not just, uh, there's a number of them. And this is, uh, you know, the same line that lines to uh, promote positive alternatives to abortion. Mr. Chuck, Representative McDonald, uh, Representative, what exactly does that mean? Specifically, Representative, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative McDonald, you know, the goal here is that we have uh, uh, a law in place that allows someone to turn a newborn over to police, firefighters, EMS, clinics, wherever they may be, and uh, in, instead of uh, maybe, they, maybe they're on the fence uh, of whether they're going to have an abortion or not, and they think, well, if I deliver the baby, and I carry the term, I know I can turn the baby over to someone in the community, and I'm not going to suffer the consequences, and that baby is going to be okay. And Representative Peterson and Ms. Rowell brought forth a, a proposal saying, you know what, we got to do a better job promoting this, because people don't know about it, and I don't know that there's any less babies being born, but we know that she pointed out how there was 13 or 14 some years ago, and we go back to 13, and now there's only three. So we seem to be uh, losing steam in understanding that you can do this. I mean, I'd love to see signs up at fire stations, uh, at uh, the local ambulance garage, or the first responders units, and to let these e EMS programs, there's no programs that cover each of their own areas, do some of the outreach, because they know their communities. Uh, thank you for representing me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this basic bill uh, is a very good basic bill. It is simply to get information on the safe place for newborns law out to whoever. And you mentioned in your discussion um, out to uh, uh, bathrooms where teenage girls might be, things like this, schools. Um, and what this amendment does is adds in there to get this information out to positive abortion alternatives grantees or the family planning grantees get that information out to them to add that piece of where the information goes, which is not a high cost thing. Once you establish the information, it just is get it out there. 
Um, the other piece that's added to this amendment is money to go to eight, re eight regional EMS programs to have them be very alert, to be able to go out and get the babies to, to, to provide uh, outreach in that. So I think that's the other piece. Um, it's, the bill is basically get this information out, the amendment adds more ideas on where it will go, and then it adds another piece on, um, on using the EMS providers, the first responders. So um, I think you should just be clear on, on what the amendment does. Representative Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Lang, for making that clear. And for potentially uh, this, I, I would offer this as a, a possible um, solution. And if you look at the A1 amendment lines 1.4 through 1.6, and if you just eliminate the information about uh, the adding it to the family plan planning grants, and since that seems to be, we're not really sure what that does at this point, we could um, delete that option and then still leave the appropriation for the EMS boards as an idea. Thank you. Uh, Representative Murphy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, I want to thank Representative Schoen for uh, bringing this issue, and it, at least from my perspective, having you know, taken care of people um, and having had um, a couple of kids myself, you do, um, in the course of um, pregnancy, uh, become familiar with and sometimes uh, connected to uh, clinics or your provider, um, and, in, and they become a guide in some ways for you. And so there's a, a real wisdom, I think, in Representative Schoen's amendment uh, in that uh, women who choose to carry their um, pregnancy to term um, but find themselves in that terrible spot of um, not wanting to, to continue to raise that child. Um, we're looking for a safe harbor. Um, that's what this legislation is about. That, that's what the law is in place already for, as I understand Representative Schoen. And um, to, uh, to add, uh, you know, the ability for uh, what would be, I believe, trusted uh, clinics, um, trusted voices uh, for uh, those women who find themselves in that, um, that uh, terrible spot uh, makes a tremendous amount of sense and just gives um, those women another option, a safe place uh, to consider uh, their choice and a safe place to... Um, safely deliver that infant. And I, I just I want to thank Representative Shona. I think this is wise and smart and uh, a good addition to the bill before us. Representative Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, my question is for the author, Ms. Peterson. Um, the uh, so you just said about striking 1.4 to 1.6. Do you intend to do that? Are you, is that another step for this bill? Or, you know, you made that comment, but I don't know where we're going with it. Uh, Representative Grunhagen, the, the motion before the committee is to have this uh, held up for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. Oh, okay. Thanks for that clarification. So, uh, another question, Mr. Chair. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Ms. Chair. Uh, this one is for uh, Ms. Rao. Uh, do, you, do you have a preference to the wording on this amendment as far as where the money goes? Rep or, excuse me, Ms. Rao. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Grunhagen, and, and members of the committee. Um, when I, I, I guess I'd like to raise a, a couple points uh, about this amendment. Um, first of all, I, and this is just my personal opinion, I'd like to specify that. <laughs> I'm not speaking for, for anyone else. Um, but when I look at this, at this amendment, um, I think particularly as far as the appropriation for the EMS boards, um, I think, I, I kind of like that one. Um, I think it's good to have a very local presence. I think that the EMS boards would likely be uh, better suited or at least very well suited to find appropriate places um, to raise awareness of the law um, and, and share that information. 
Um, as far as the first part of the amendment, though, related to the positive alternatives and family planning special projects grantees and providing the information to them, um, my understanding of, of this is, first of all, this doesn't preclude other outreach that the Department of Human Services would do, because I think there's a lot of other things that, that they could do as well, and I um, would, would hope and expect that this doesn't stop anything else. This is just a, one example that we'd be putting in. Um, but but as far as, as those grantees go, I'm not sure that they are best suited to reach um, the, the folks that this program, that this law is really intended for. Um, the Safe Place for Newborns law was originally put into effect not as an alternative to adoption, um, but as a resource for folks who, frankly, are desperate. Um, I, I think that we have a standard adoption process in Minnesota, which is a, a healthier and, and better option for the vast majority of people who decide to bring their children to term, but opt not to parent them themselves. Um, I think that's a, a better route to go, rather than really encouraging people who are seeking help with their pregnancies um, to, to do the Safe Place for Newborns program. This is really intended for those desperate cases where a woman, frankly, is, is either in denial that she's pregnant or unaware. Um, she delivers the child, and she doesn't know what to do. And those are the children that are at risk, and those are the infants that this law is intending to save. Um, so we have a very small number of these cases. That, you know, we, we don't necessarily want a lot of children relinquished through this program because it's not the healthiest thing for, for the mother. She's, she's in a, a difficult situation. Um, we would rather encourage folks that are getting treatment and going to clinics to look at other options, um, whether that's parenting themselves or adoption. Um, but this is for those folks who are not seeking help. Thank you. Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the thoughtful discussion around all this. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, my question, uh, first of all, I guess we'll go to uh, potentially uh, Representative Peterson. Uh, in the event um, this amendment is not a, adopted, is there anything in the language that would prohibit us from addressing the concerns that Representative uh, Sean brings up? Um, it, it seems pretty uh, wide open, if you will. Uh, could we accomplish what Representative Sean is requesting in the language without the amendment? Representative Peterson. Mr. Chair, Representative Hamilton, I'm, I'm no attorney, but really my, my bill does not uh, appropriate any money to the EMS services uh, if there already is some language within the law that would address that, then maybe so, but um, I, unfortunately, since I didn't bring this amendment, I didn't really come prepared to discuss it. I don't know, maybe Representative Sean might have a better answer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, okay. Mr. Chairman, could staff or somebody ask that? Is there anything with the language that would not, the way it stands right now on House Valley 25, um, could the dollars be directed in the way that uh, Representative Sean has requested as well? Or is there something that would prohibit that from taking place? Uh, thank you, Representative Hamilton. We'll ask uh, Mr. Berg to answer that question. Mr. Berg. Mr. Berg, Representative Hamilton. I think for the information piece, the first part of uh, Representative Sean's amendment, the distributing information through positive alternatives and the grantees under the family planning grant, the base bill is pretty broad. It allows the Commissioner of Human Services to, or directs them to distribute information and puts no restrictions on what method they go through to distribute information. I, I doubt if the second portion, which specifically directs a certain amount to public, to local EMS boards, would happen under the base bill. That was something the department would want our direction on. We could certainly do, distribute information to local EMS boards, but that part directing a transfer of funds would not happen. All right, thank you. And Mr. Chairman? We're going to help. I don't know what the proper motion would be, but I, I would have a suggestion. If 
think it divided the, the amendment uh, between lines 1.6 and 1.7. Uh, vote um, first on the, the top part, the 1.1, 1.6. And uh, since staff said that could be covered already, potentially, um, I would ask that we would vote against that part, uh, to strike that part, and then I'd like to speak to the second half afterwards, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Hamilton. And first, I would like to ask uh, staff uh, to kind of walk through that, ask us if it's divisible. Are you also asking for a roll call? Uh, it's. Uh, Someone else can. Um, Mr. Chair, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, I might be able to help this situation. Let me give you a chance to comment on this real quick. Uh, I'd like to, uh, Representative Shaw. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, knowing that the base bill is pretty broad, and it would probably, it would cover what we're trying to accomplish in 1.4 to 1.6, uh, I think that that's a, a fair, um, I, I think, Representative Peterson's bill actually already covers what our party covers that. And so I'd uh, be amenable to uh, removing 1.4 to 1.5 and 1.6. I would draw. Representative Schoen, uh, Representative Hamilton, uh, will you withdraw your division? Yes, I'm sure. If we uh, address Representative Schoen's uh, question with that. Um, if I could ask staff if that. Uh, Bill would still hold together uh, striking those lines, or if that uh, we remain structural, we do that in this case. Mr. Chair, yes, um, by removing and deleting lines 1.4 to 1.6, um, the rest of the bill together is fine. Uh, Representative Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say I think there's already a motion on the table. Um, then you should probably withdraw and then we could take up Representative Sean's motion. The, the motion to divide Representative Murphy? Uh, I think you had made a motion that you were um, calling for a roll call vote on the entire amendment. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'll withdraw, the, I'll withdraw the roll call request for that and uh, to Representative uh, Sean. Good. All right, yes, sir. So, uh, well, thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say that Mr. Burke overlooked a piece of this. Um, I think on line 1.12, it does say grant funds may be used to offset costs included in the transportation of an infant. So I think that that does actually broaden. That is not contained with, within the original language, which, as I understand it, is, a, is just about distributing information. So I think there is. I don't know if that's relevant to what all just happened. I'm not really sure why Representative Hamilton was asking that with regard to dividing or whatever, but I just wanted to make that point. There, there is something distinctly different in the amendment that's not subsumed under the original bill. So um, other than that, um, I, I just wanted to say something about the fact that um, this is adding a specific dollar amount, and there was some discussion about that earlier, and, um, you know, I, I guess I didn't quite understand why the chair was getting a roll call on this, but if it has to do with putting in a specific amount, um, the process here, and laying a bill over for in possible inclusion, it kind of almost doesn't matter what the amount is. I mean, it, I think it's important for Representative Schoen wants to say, here, I want to put some dollars on the table, that's great, but from the point of view of the chair, if this gets laid over for possible inclusion, this committee can see it again with maybe not at all, or maybe with, you know, whatever amount, it could have the whole budget surplus in it for all we know if the chair wanted to go that far. So, you know, I don't really see why that would keep us from adopting this amendment. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Leeming, Representative Leeming. Um, I think that uh, the amendment changes appropriation. I think there are two appropriations well, because it would have an appropriation for the information that would go out in the distribution, and then it would have an appropriation for divided equally among the eight regional EMS boards. So there's two appropriations, and that's why it's changed to a plural. Um, so I think it stands fine. All right. Now, um, Further discussion, Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, um, and thank 
the members of Sean for working with us on that as well. Um, the second half of that, uh, the suggestion I was going to make is, um, goes to uh, what uh, Representative Lee was saying as well. If the author is okay with that too, um, strike the, the 500 and put the proverbial dot, dot, dot in there as we continue having these conversations and what the dollar amount would be. But suggestion. Mr. Chair, I'm glad to uh, accommodate that since we can, if it's being held over, we can do whatever we want, or well, you can. And then hit the hit with the ready leader and do it now. I mean, that's uh, that's up to you. I'm, I'm amenable. And Representative Hamilton, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. The reason I ask that is, is to, you know, just so that we can gain a better understanding versus taking a position here on what that dollar amount should be, uh, so that we can continue the conversations with Representative Sean and the author. And, and uh, so, again, versus taking a position on what that dollar amount should be here today, I'm not comfortable with that. So, if you would accept that, I mean, greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Hamilton and uh, Representative Sean. So then would it be your intention or would it be acceptable to say that we were to strike lines 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, and 500,000 in one in line 1 1.8 and incorporate that as a part of your amendment to the amendment? I'm a yes. Uh, then I will make the motion uh, for the committee that we strike lines 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, and in line 1.8, strike 500,000 and uh, dot, dot, dot. Ms. Eves, is that uh, structurally sound? Mr. Chair, yes. All right. Uh, why don't we go ahead and incorporate that? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those no. Motion prevails. Uh, Representative Loeffler to the amended amendment. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and we as a committee uh, we debated a lot of things and how to best structure programs as they get implemented. Um, and uh, I think that uh, Representative Shaw has brought a, an interesting idea in terms of how to get that local connection um, and access for that mother to someone that she trusts that will honor. Her anonymity is trained on HIPAA and, and privacy in a way that she may not feel as comfortable on her own traveling to a facility that may or may not have a trained volunteer at the reception desk or whatever or be seen by others in that public setting. Um, I do think that we should, as this evolves, um, and invite Representative Schoen and the Department of Health and others to get us some, some information about just the distribution of child caring um, women. Um, because that is not equally distributed across the eight EMS uh, organizations, nor are the number of, of uh, serving agencies equally distributed. Um, in in rural areas, they tend to be more concentrated. In um, suburban areas and elsewhere, it tends to be more concentrated. And it's just a fact of demographics. We have a lot more childbearing women age. Um, in the metropolitan area and in the regional centers than we have in some other areas. And I think the distribution for this purpose should should to be targeted towards the purpose of the, the grant. And I, I think that just helps us be sure that, that the people who need to know about this who sometimes end up in, in very um, difficult situations and are struggling with mental health or physical or other issues in their life, um, sometimes it's the victims of incest and other issues that we don't have to talk about very much, um, but they all have equal access to the kind of care that we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, Representative Loeffler, is there a uh, further discussion on the A1 amendment as amended? Representative Leland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, um, I, I must say, I'm disappointed at moving 500,000. And the reason for that, Representative Hamilton, because plenty of bills are going through this legislature that have dollar amounts attached to them. And um, I frankly don't understand the big sensitivity to that. We all know that you can't possibly fund all the bills. I mean, if you were to add up all the dollar amounts that are flowing through, um, you know, 
far, far exceed our ability to fund them. And uh, I just think that to put a dollar amount in there, as Representative Schoen did, and started out saying he wanted to do that. That was a, kind of the point of, one of the big points of his amendment, I thought, and I'm just disappointed that we can't even pass that for something as important as this, so we can't put any kind of dollar amount to it. And that 500000 as I understood it, was kind of at that larger level because of this wanting to provide funds for transportation. So the information piece can happen, you know, probably pretty low cost and doesn't cost that much to say to organizations, remember the service is available, be sure that women know about it, you know, put up a poster here and there. The piece that really would cost some money was, would be allowing this transportation to be available. And I think even though Representative Roth was surely right about the demographics and the distribution and all that, um, you know, having some funds to offset that cost of that transportation, I would think would be pretty important. So um, I just, you know, I certainly support the amendment, but I just think that, frankly, that, that all the discomfort over putting a dollar amount in there is, um, you know, sorry, but it just seems a little weak to me. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, that's all. Thank you, Representative Lincoln. Representative Hamilton. Although, Mr. Chairman and Representative Lincoln, I'm sorry. I don't understand why you want to put a cap on it. I don't know if there are thousands and not, but I think Representative Sean Lynn's put the great idea. And so why should we stop for the 500,000? Maybe it's a million, maybe it's two. So let's not cut off the debate. Uh, let's properly fund it. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, uh, is it possible or not? We better. Uh... <laughs> 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 All right. Let's go ahead and adopt the A1 amendment as amended. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And the A1 amendment is adopted. Um, Representative Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, thank you for this wonderful discussion. I think that uh, we can do some real good things for the state of Minnesota, and I appreciate your support on this. Thank you, Representative Peterson, and thanks, uh, Representative Schoen, for bringing forward the amendment and for the good discussion. I think we found some uh, folks on the committee who are more than happy to work with you. If you have another bill or want to make this uh, better, uh, we would certainly welcome that uh, uh, future discussion before the committee. Uh, before we go to is there anybody from the audience who would like to testify for or against? House file 825. Seeing none, uh, any closing comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please, of the motion. Representative of Peterson renews your motion, the House file 825. I'm sorry. Uh, I moved the bill, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I will renew my motion uh, for uh, House file 825. Be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. As amended. As amended. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion for sales. Laid over for possible inclusion. And next up, House file 870, Representative Schumacher is next up.
for this R2 support program delivery and evaluation, outreach across the state and administrative supports. ACT is a leader in the Minnesota disability community. The services that they provide to thousands of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities across the state are, across the state are very impressive. And this is a uh, group that's very active in the southwest corner of the state and already and uh, does very good work uh, with what they're given. In your folder, you'll find uh, ACT's 2014 annual report, which highlights the good work of the organization throughout the year. ACT's mission is to help people with disabilities take control of their lives and assert their right to self determination. Uh, here with me on the committee is Mary Kay Kennedy, who is uh, with the organization and has some remarks as well. Thank you. Welcome to the meeting, Mr. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Great. Thank you, Chair Dean and the members of the committee for this opportunity to address the committee um, and talk about my agency, Advocating Change Together. My name is Mary Kay Kennedy and I'm the Executive Director. Um, as just noted in your packet, there's a copy of um, Act's 2014 Annual Report as well as a flyer that um, brings what we did in the annual report summarizes the work of the organization. And it also includes the testimony that I'm giving here today. I'm here to speak of House file, on House File 870, which is an agency appropriation of 490000 over the biennium to cover the costs associated with delivery of our unique statewide advocacy training program. Act has just celebrated our 36th anniversary, but the work is far from finished. We've grown from a small group of small groups of advocates in the metro area to serving citizens around the state through six regional chapters. Our Self Advocates Minnesota, or SAM Networks, supports our mission to help people with disabilities see themselves as part of a larger disability rights movement and to develop self-advocacy skills to take, take control of their lives. The $490,000 appropriation is divided into three areas. The first is program delivery and evaluation, the second outreach activities and materials, and the third administrative supports to the agency. The funds to be used for, for um, program delivery and evaluation, we are asking for $120,000. These funds will be used for our Train the Trainer program, direct support of our Human Rights Training program, and curriculum development. These programs are offered throughout the state and focus on peer-to-peer -peer training programs, education access, employment, housing, transportation, and voters' rights. The second area is outreach activities and materials. For this, we are asking 280000 these funds support conferencing and disability advocacy network. We host and participate in a variety of, re a variety of regional conferences across the state of Minnesota, and we host a state conference for hundreds of self-advocates to gather and share their community experiences. Additionally, we are working on developing community inclusion training materials accessible to persons with cognitive, sensory, and physical disabilities all items mandated by the Homestead decision. And the third area is for indirect and general operating. We are requesting 90000 These funds will be used to help cover administrative and general operating costs associated with managing the facilities, program delivery, staff, and technology. As the Homestead um, decision implementation plan makes demands on your budget, it also makes demands on ours as well. We will continue to work collaboratively with other agencies to address the needs of our citizens, employees, and family, employers and families. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Is there any questions for the testifier? Representative Halverson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for um, the information about the EO program and, and I'm Especially as we are um, encouraging, it, you know, uh, people with disabilities to find their voice and become um, independent, um, both under the Olmstead Act, and I think just because it's the right thing to do, frankly, um, I'm, I'm happy to um, see an organization that um, is assisting with folks like that. I um, have a couple of questions just um, on, on process on the bill, and, and I'm 
it's still fairly new here. I don't recall, uh, do we do a lot of direct appropriations to nonprofits, or do we tend to do more granting type appropriations as a state government? Does anybody know? Thank you, Ms. Hulbert. Uh, Ms. McMurray is the person best equipped to answer that question about how we uh, fund both uh, statutorily uh, through the committee and elsewhere with the grants. Mr. Yeah. Chair, this bill does not directly appropriate to the organization. It appropriates it is the on line 1.8 to the petition human services. And that is a requirement. We do not have or appropriate directly to a non governmental entity that I'm aware Thank you, Mr. Chair. Perhaps that helps. Follow up. Thank you um, for that clarification. I'm sorry. I wasn't having, didn't have my glasses on when I read the bill. Um, the other question would be, um, uh, is it possible, um, or the other, um, has the other considered um, any kind of uh, report back to um, the department about uh, the successes of the grant um, and the, the ways that it gets used? Um, it feels like there might be not only opportunities for us to see how the grant money gets used, but for um, other organizations to perhaps have some learning opportunity um, to find. Uh, to what works and what's successful. Uh, I think we can consider. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, I'll present the other one. I'm going to consider that at this point, but thank you again, Dan. We'll be considering it now. Thank you. And uh, I think there is some interest in addressing that to it from the others at the table. Yes, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, we are very um, committed to evaluation. So we have had interns from the University of Minnesota who work with us on different projects to um, evaluate, and we, we hired um, independent evaluation, and we also do what we call um, program, program effectiveness assessments. So um, just last year we had one for our whole agency, which really helped us kind of figure out if we're meeting community needs, and we would, I'd be happy to share those assessments with you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Curtis, please uh, uh, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and uh, go ahead and address that and any other comments that you have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to be here with the committee. I'm Brian Bateman, and I'm advocating Jake Shepard. And this is a continuation of the appropriation we received a few years ago, where some of the we have made uh, uh, a report on how we spent those funds. So I uh, just wanted to uh, let you know that we understand that we're, we're spending tax dollars and we can help them on the handle of how we're choosing those, those funds. We, for sure, will have to make better plans. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Representative Ernie Hagan. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think the testifiers, you know, I don't know if it was a week or ten days ago or it was longer. Uh, there's a front page headline in the Naples Tribune about the monies appropriated for disability uh, use and that they're not being used either at the county or the state level. I, I can't I didn't get a chance to read the whole article, but I heard about eight half of it. But uh, do any of you understand what's behind that? And if some of that money that's not being used or that has been already appropriated could be used for this purpose or reappropriated for this purpose? Yes. Ms. Kennedy. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I don't feel qualified to answer that. I'm not an expert. However, there are some folks in the audience who could answer and respond to that, but it doesn't pertain to this. But this particular list should not pertain to the fraud labor program, so this is not included in the labor programs. I think, uh, Representative Ron Hagen, that this uh, probably wouldn't be as applicable to this group, but it is something that I'm sure folks on the committee read. I believe it was in the Sunday paper and will be, uh, be addressing in the committee in the weeks ahead uh, as, we, as we move towards the budget. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Schumacher, thank you for bringing this uh, great bill to us today. Question for Ms. Kennedy and Prentice. Uh, is this a different program than the one that uh, we met with and uh, talked about the, with some legislation that we're working on? Mr. Chair and um, Representative McDonald, it actually is. So if you look at our annual report, um, you'll see the program that we were talking about is actually one of the programs that on table four and five that actually does require designated money for this program, where the, the money that we're requesting here supports the 
overall goals of the organization, but does not support um, does not support this specific program. Representative McDonald. Thank you. So, Ms. Kennedy, so uh, this particular ask doesn't deliver steam at conferences or coordinate to the uh, annual leadership program? Um, Ms. Kennedy. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative McDonald, the appropriation that is in front of us now, the uh, request for, for 490000 for House File um, 870 actually does include the monies that I just kind of outlined. So there would be about 124 delivery of programs and then also outreach and, and conferencing around the state. And the program that I think you're referring to is called the Olmsted Academy, is that correct? And that program is a, um, it's a, it's a program that needs to be funded separately. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think we do need to much more involve um, self-advocates in, in uh, working with each other to be um, role models for each other because I think a lot, we still have a lot of people who have not seen the full range of opportunities that might be available to them in either housing and workforce um, in community integration and, um, you know, we all get referrals from our friends and tend to trust them, and that's true of anyone um, who might be invited to something that they haven't participated in before. And so I think this is really, really key and important. I would hope that we would continue to, to work with this and try and figure out how to more intensely um, integrate it in with the rollout of Olmsted transitional planning. Um, because I think people will trust a self-advocate who talks about how difficult it was for them and kind of scary to leave a group home, to go to a better page with a, a roommate and have someone just checking in on them a few times a week and um, what, what worked well, what didn't, and then what they wish they'd known when they first did that. The same thing with changing employment. And um, I think that we have a lot of providers who are interested in playing key roles in that, but I think they're Hearing it from someone who's actually lived and experienced that, I think, is, is probably more motivational. Um, I do have a little bit of a concern, and, and I'll talk with you further about it, but um, you have narrowed it in line one point two oh to people who are working and living in institutionalized settings. And we have a lot of young people coming up through our education system who have not seen a vision of what their life could be like as an adult person with um, a disability. And I would not limit it uh, to just those people because I think there's a lot of people who are living at home in our, in our education system who would absolutely um, appreciate the opportunity to participate in this as well. So it's just a broadening um, of that vision. Representative Schumacher. Sorry, Ms. Kennedy. Chair and members of the committee, I absolutely agree with that. The, the language does um, specifically mention people that are living and working in institutionalized settings as for targeted outreach, but our network absolutely includes people who self-identify as people with disabilities, people that are still in school and living with their parents. So it's really a, a very diverse group. Thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, is there, we have no amendments on this bill. Is there anybody from the audience that would like to speak for or against this? Um, please uh, proceed with the testimony. Take on it. Introduce yourself for the record. Mr. Heller, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself.
uh, and if you, if you come from the research, the House Research Department from Mary Mullen, it's online. I'm waiting for the uh, accessible PDFs of those from that department, and then there's on the back, there's another one from the Minnesota, Minnesota Department of uh, Education from their, uh, their, uh, their a person there regarding the, 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 the go between, between the Department of Education and the Minnesota has a, uh, his, his name is Abash. Anyhow, um, most I'm skeptical today because in these documents, it talks about third party vendors. And it's my understanding that Minnesota Statute 16E, uh, Subdivision sub 9, only requires state agencies to comply to certain national technology accessibility standards. And I have a piece of paper here that I'm asking somebody in this committee to ask a question. Because when I ask a question, the public don't hear about it. And I have that single sheet here, and I wrote on it. I'd like to provide that for you. So we can provide that to you. That would be helpful. Thank um, you, uh, Paige. will uh, get the document that you brought, and, uh, and then, uh, we will incorporate that. Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Chair. Can you um, please continue, Mr. Allen. Thank you. Uh, this is a two-part thing. Is the materials accessible with a blind and print disabled uh, regarding Minnesota Statute 16E? <laughs> and the other part of this is my understanding Department of uh, Health or, or, or Human Services or both are required to follow a plain language initiative under 144.056 and it has to do with text difficulty. Uh, that department specifically has to start the reading. That probably has to do with the, the cognitive disability, the development of disability, so you know, some are ADHD and autism uh, in those areas, according to Minnesota Department of Education. So really, the, the needed question here is we continually have grant money out to third-party vendors. Don't we, wouldn't we like them to, to provide it in a fully accessible format and set the reading level for the tenant audience especially? But their preference is oral language, and they understand that best. Because we don't want to shut them off, we want to engage them. There's three elements uh, that really fit into this, especially the why. I don't think I've heard about principle of universal design. However, and for learning, there's three elements it's the what, how, and why. If we turn off the why network, it's called the effect network, which is the center of our brain, which is also a reward system. We won't be engaged in the process with the written word. However, I found out for myself, being a, a non-reader, a terrible reader, I didn't engage with, in, a, in the printed word. However, once it was read out loud, and I could follow along, my comprehension turned into understanding, and I started owning this stuff. I think this whole thing about the last bill, and this bill is we continue to hand money out. We want to improve people's engagement. Are these websites compliant? Are the documents of freedom compliant and not at all? What's the, what's the text difficulty? Just we all have that plan. Um, they spell it with the reading level. I had a conversation with Christine about two weeks ago. I think she's the, I think she's the, uh, she's on the, on the uh, committee on the Alps and plan. She's the assistant community chair or something. Anyhow, she said specifically, I asked her, well, what are you supposed to set the text difficulty for? Because I had heard about plain language being in seventh grade. And she says, what plan I'll set on a fourth grade reading level? And using our new metric that we have adopted without really any discussion called let's have it. So what is it? When, uh, when I had a discussion with Ms. Wick, that I think the State Development of the Disability Group and the Centennial Group, and I coached her about the Hofstede uh, draft, the main report, she didn't know the level. 
So then I went to three different departments. And then I came back to ACT, when Brady said next to me. And they created a nice summary, and they sent it to me. And they asked me to print it, and I said, I don't think I have the authority to do that. To this date, I don't even, I had asked her today, what was the reading level that she refuses to tell me? Something about when, when, when Christy and I's world, when I mentioned ACT, I don't know what's, what's going on, but I, I think that we all need to work together and really get serious about the fucking people in charge to overload that information and not make an accessible world on text to speech. And what we do is the individuals who are pumps. I think everybody's on that page and you want to be more engaged and have a good purpose for the potential. I, I entertain any question, or any kind of question I want to check that ask that would make it um, reliable and valid. Because again, if it has lost the question, the cop will be on it, then we can start the engagement process. And I respect the leadership to do that. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Representative Hamilton has a question for Representative Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the testifier. Um, what recommendations would you have on how we go forth to, to set those reading levels? Chair, uh, Representative, well, first of all, do we want to rescind the uh, one four four point one five six? Is, is that most of all that? Is that probably uh, somebody needs to know the answer? Is this the health? Is it the commissioner? Or does somebody know that that applies to uh, uh, health and human services, for instance, or just the health department? We need to know that. Now, the, the thing is, I say, if first of all, these first grade using themselves and printing out from people that we did not have to hold them on. Which is basically you're working on your shit off and you're not, you're not, you're not really functional and not really adding much information. So I mean, that's what seconds to start. Anyhow, uh, the recommendations is it has to come from the advisor's office, but I think the young people are people on the table. I'm not a, I'm not a world science, but I do have some just testifiers who wrote down her name is Mrs. Will. She's the, we have a person in the, the only person in the country. That looks at assessments, for instance, that, that looks at uh, pencils, personal journals design, and they look at special ed. And she just finished it up, and now she's going down English language. And I said, the reason we have personal journals design is because we get those valuable and reliable information that the individual can know and do. Now, so I guess, simply stated, if, if they're the number of posts that I'm not sure enough to look at on the website. My intent is, which, which she expressed to me, and she will not be talking about it. First, we have an Excel number, and we have a kid in TCMC, it's real friends, and she's not uh, a test or something that's kind of being challenged. And, and maybe develop this way to put out a lot of family for an individual's education plan to size or a little school team is that. Uh, that uh, they provide an independent level of the ABMCA uh, three, let's say, and, and that's in exile. So my suggestion is, first of all, figure out what metric we're going to use. That would be the first thing. And then perhaps talk to the people that are now and ask, ask them uh, or ask other departments how about the lack of our data post? I mean, chapter 13, you can ask the candidate how they come up with those great legal That would be another way of going through that. But no, I think that the discussion needs to start. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Keller. And uh, we will be reaching out to staff at both the Department of Human Services and the Department of Health. Uh, regarding the plain language statute, hope to have something back for you, and we will very likely have them uh, before our committee again, and uh, hopefully we'll be getting back to you before that time. And then I will also copy and distribute uh, the email that you provided to me for the rest of the committee, Mr. Heller. Thank you for your testimony today. And just, just for the record, if the committee is a party, you'll see some data. 